to truck it it's time for your nooner with dooner but before we get into the show today i want to shine a light on what happened with this horrible earthquake if you can roll some of this video here you can see iskander harbor um in turkey this is where all these boxes fell over look at those flames there this has been raging on for a few days now and this is just the harbor but i shared this on linkedin you can see right there that's a drone going through all of that um all of that destruction. I think we have a daytime one too, and you can really see all the cans just spilled all over the place, but that is nothing close to, I believe the death toll has been updated to 11,000, and they're still pulling people out of the rubble. This is the worst, the deadliest seismic event in the past decade. I put this out on LinkedIn because I know that there's a lot of people in the freight community who step up and help like help in these events. And I asked the community if they did. Um, I said, if anyone logistics is throwing together aid or support, DM me, we'll be happy to amplify. And Yusuf Kanzi most certainly did. He says um, his team is organizing aid. Here's what they're looking for. They need tents, winter coats, gloves, headgear, sleeping bags, blankets, baby formula, diapers, feminine hygiene products, flashlights, head warmers, thermos bottles. Uh, he says the deadline for delivery is February 15th. All supplies are being gathered at their warehouse to be prepared and shipped. That would be at General Brokerage Services at 285 Eldridge Road, Fairfield, New Jersey, 07004. Shipments to Turkey are being arranged by Port X via Turkish Airlines. And again, that is contact Yusef Kanzi for full details. Also, if you're putting together other relief, right, let me know. I'll help you amplify it. You can email me, tduner at freightwaves.com. That's D-O-O-N-E-R. Or DM me on LinkedIn or Twitter, Timothy Dooner. Um, prayers for all the people out there impacted. And I know the community is going to step up. So God bless you guys and everyone impacted. Um, today on the show, we're going to be thinking inside the box. I got Rachel Premack on here. And we get to talk about some of the humble side of freight, the humble cardboard box and how this can be a leading indicator of the freight and retail economy. She'll spell it all out for us. We might even get into some chassis too. Uh, we've got from Riverside to double wide, uh, Riverside double wide to Blockbuster Brokerage, the Edge logistics story with Will Kerr. We'll talk about how he built um, Edge, how they brought tech in. They won an award last year. We might even get him to rip into non-competes. Um, we also have trucker battle, trucker, ba trucker versus trucker in a unique take on trivia. It's what the the trivia, all sorts of stuff. Hopefully you learned something during that. Before we get into everything though, got to tip the band. So here we go. You may think of AIT, Worldwide Logistics, as an average U.S. forwarder, but in the past decade, um, they've evolved to become a global transportation management leader, generating nearly $3 billion in annual revenue by providing supply chain solutions for Fortune 500 companies shipping between Asia, Europe, and North America. Despite the company's exponential growth, they are still experts when it comes to creating customized solutions to fill your supply chain requirements. Find out how your business can benefit from AIT's logistics pros over at AIT worldwide.com but right now we have editorial director at freight waves it's rachel premack rachel i watched the state of the union last night and i gotta say it was one of the more fashionable ones i saw a lot of people in that crowd and they had a uh, some un unique outfits you had like fedora hat guy you had the yellow dress yeah i mean marjorie taylor green had that great white coat there is a lot of a lot of good style i felt like the crowd was very like Lots of different colors in that sea of, you know, usually like black or navy kind of suits. Lots of different kinds of kind of stuff going on, which is always fun. Yeah, there's such a spectacle. It's funny, too. I, I think more people watch these things now than like the Grammys. Like the Grammys just had, and I only know because people were like freaking out about Satan or something. So that's how I knew the Grammys happened. I, and then I looked it up. I'm old. I didn't even know anyone who was who is nominated. But I think like the new like public forum is is like going on Twitter and watching these political events. Well, the way that C-SPAN um, documents it all is like it's almost like a like a play or something because you see these famous people talking, but you don't know what they're saying. You can kind of like see they're mouthing something, but you know exactly what they're saying. So it's it's kind of it is kind of um, it's very mysterious what's going on. And these are the most powerful people in the or some of the most powerful people in the country. So it's interesting seeing them, you know, basically at work hanging out. 
Yeah, a little modern Greek theater. Um, let's yeah. talk about our own theater. Let's talk about the humble cardboard box. Because you put out this really interesting issue of modes last week, and it was talking about um, telltale signs and indicators and what the humble cardboard box has to say. What did you discover in looking into the cardboard box? Yeah, so it's a pretty uh, spooky situation that's going on in the cardboard industry right now. U.S. box shipments actually fell by 8.4% uh, in Q4 of last year. That's the biggest decline since uh, one quarter in 2009. Uh, operating rates in terms of uh, how active these factories are, that's down to 80.9%. That's the lowest uh, last seen in 2009. So basically 20% of the factories that are used to produce these boxes are stagnant. And this kind of just goes back to a lot of what else we've been seeing in the economy more broadly, which is that a lot of these companies were super active in you know, end of 2020 through 2021. And now um, through 2022, they basically saw that they had too much inventory, uh, too much capacity, and they're trying to draw back a little bit. That would make a sense. a lot of it. I mean, that would make sense given the inventory glut, right? They probably, did they, pro they, they produce more boxes, I would imagine too. So they kind of have their own cardboard box bullwhip effect happening. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, one thing that people don't realize about cardboard boxes, it's not just uh, what you receive from Amazon or Walmart or wh wherever you do your e-commerce shopping, though, of course, that is a big consumer of cardboard. Basically, everything you buy in a store at one point spends time in a cardboard box. So it could be, um, you know, whatever you're buying from the farmer's market, presumably to to move that to the farmer's market from the farm or from the whatever facility it's coming from, you do have to put that in a cardboard box at one point. So it's not just uh, e-commerce orders or what have you that's changing. It's uh, a pretty good barometer of retail activity as a whole uh, is declining uh, quite noticeably, especially when you look at uh, the cardboard industry. Interesting. So are, are we seeing any, any change? Is this, is this steady systematic decline keep happening? And is it, are you of the opinion that when you see an uptick in this, you would also see an uptick in say like the freight economy? Yeah, they, they do seem to track somewhat closely, but it is important to note that a lot of freight, not all freight is tied directly to retail. you also have automotive, you have agriculture, you have uh, chemical goods. You have all these things that aren't necessarily e-commerce orders or what's going in on the grocery shelf. So they do track somewhat closely, but it's not exactly a one-to-one -one comparison. In my opinion, cardboard would be a good way to track van is specifically, but and maybe reefer as well, but it's not an exact one-to-one -one comparison. How about so cons consumer, good, Rachel? Good. Consumer Rachel, do you like when they put, do you like a, uh, a customized box? Like my dogs, they get bark box, right? And it says bark box right on the outside. They know exactly what it is when it comes. I know exactly what it is and everybody in the house gets excited. I do, although it's not, a, not the best for gifts. So if you're giving a gift to someone that says, oh, it's from blah, blah company, it kind of, kind of ruins the surprise. But otherwise, Honestly, if it if it if it makes the whatever I'm buying cheaper, then sure, don't put the don't put a label on it. But you know, sometimes it's fun. Interesting. Did you learn anything fascinating by diving into this world of cardboard box? I remember uh, about two years ago, I had to do an interview with someone from this company called Chap, who who runs a ton of pallets. And beforehand, I'm like, how in God's name am I going to do 45 to 60 minutes on pallets? And I and it was one of those interviews where I just wish I had more time afterwards because it was so fascinating, all the positioning and everything that went into the pallet supply chain. Yeah, I I have also interviewed people from Chap, and I've noticed the same thing. I was like, pallets. Oh, where do I where do I start with this? But it it. That is also an interesting side of the economy. I had to learn a lot about the various vocabulary words, basically. So there's there's craft board, there's container board, there's box board. And box board, I guess one big differentiator, box board is basically like a thin, more almost like laminated paper, something you might expect if you're buying beer that's going to come in what's called a box board. But container board 
is what's used to make cardboard boxes. That's when you have that those two layers on the outside and then the wavy corrugated situation on the inside. So, uh, you know, reading these reports, I've had to kind of brush up on my paper vocabulary, essentially. Um, I don't know if that's interesting per se, but it was certainly something I've had to learn writing about this. Absolutely. Well, hey, there was another story that's up on on freight waves, and it's in the battle of intermodal truckers versus ocean carriers. And it sounds like it may be a win for intermodal truckers. What is happening there? Because this is a big problem. When I was reading this article, it said this issue costs trucking companies $1.8 billion a year. Yeah, so it's one of those other kind of parts of the supply chain that you wouldn't think about if you didn't know a lot about port trucking. And this is certainly something that I wasn't aware of, that this is such a leading issue. So um, basically, ocean carriers limit the types of chassis that port truck drivers use to carry containers around the ports. And you need these chassis just to move containers around the ports. Very important. And this sort of chassis limitation is actually was one pretty big bottleneck in 2021 when we saw all that craziness uh, going on at the ports and uh, so much uh, lag and delays in offloading containers and moving containers around. So uh, this ruling from Monday, it definitely will uh, hopefully ease some of these bottlenecks and just make the whole supply chain a little bit more efficient, basically. Um, For me, I was surprised to hear that ocean carriers do limit the producer of the chassis that the port truck drivers can use to carry uh, containers. I mean, that just seems like a like a weird kind of bottleneck to have. It seems like something that would be pretty easy to solve, pretty easy to address. So I think this is something that could certainly uh, ease a lot of supply chain bottlenecks. Well, I, I know that during the pandemic, guys like um, Ian Wyland and Matt Strap over at Harbor Trucking Association, that was one of the biggest thorns in their side was chassis positioning and like the different color mm. pools for containers. It was a huge mess. And, it was a, and he, they, they identified as a big problem, their inefficiency. They were talking about all these yards and everything. He's like, we can't even get out of the port to begin with due to this. So that's cool to hear. I, I did hear a rumor that your next humble topic you're taking on is bubble wrapped. Have you, have you, uh, can you tease that? Yeah. So, uh, when I wrote that cardboard piece last week, a few people reached out and said, Oh, maybe one reason why cardboard is down is because e-commerce providers are switching to those, those like plastic bags, those like big envelopes essentially, rather than shipping in boxes. And unfortunately, uh, for the economy at large, that's not the case. Um, Those sorts of plastic uh, packaging solutions are also um, on the decline. Uh, Sealed Air, which is the producer of bubble wrap specifically, they pre-announced earnings a few weeks ago saying that uh, they're expecting, uh, you know, they expected, and then they, they had an unusually challenging Q4 uh, and we'll see those the full scope of those earnings tomorrow morning. So if you want to learn more about this topic, um, FreightWaves.com slash mode, you'll see it in your uh, inbox uh, tomorrow morning. Nice. Well, I, I'm excited to read more, and I will check that out tomorrow. Rachel, thank you so much for your time today. And guess what? I'm sparing you from trivia because I am going to put um, – Justin and Rooster at the end of the show through uh, What the Trivia Squid Game we got going on here. By the way, if you have a rival, this just this doesn't go to just Rachel. This goes to anybody. If you got a rival, you want to challenge in trivia on this show, someone you think you're smarter than, someone you think you can beat, someone you think you're more clever than, bring him on here. Take him on. What the Trivia. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Well, meanwhile... Got a raccoon over here who, speaking of pallets, he hitchhiked on some, and he ended up over at a distribution center in Colorado, causing this havoc, because the poor workers there are attempting to get him out of the wall. And even if you, yeah, just sit up like a... It's in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, just... Son of a gun. Oh, he's got... Apparently, this whole operation took 45 minutes to resolve. It took the animal control officers. 
I've had uh, Will Kerr's got moves like that. Put him on Soldier Field. <laughs> What's up? My next guest is Will Kerr, president over at Edge Logistics. And he looks great. I like I like the room. Where, where are you chilling out today, Will? You look great, too. I love your hat. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. It matches my shirt. <laughs> How's that? Uh, where are you chilling right now? You in Chicago? How's things? Yeah, our uh, corporate headquarters in Chicago, Illinois. Yep. Yeah. A cold well, here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, how how is the office doing? Things buzzing, things back up to speed. How does how does Edge look? I've looked at some of your recent posts, and um, you've been taking a couple victory laps. Yeah, we've had a really exciting uh, run here the last you know nine years, really, but more more notably the last few. Um, we've had a tremendous response from our customers and our carriers, just wanting to do more and more and more business with us, and uh, that's that's really led to uh, to a lot of success here. Um, and a lot of growth. You know, it didn't start out that way, though, right? It started out in a double-wide trailer, right by a river. Man in a van by a river. Yeah, tell me, uh, tell was, me about, tell me about that. Will, what was what was day one like of Edge? It, it was at a river. It was it was the East <laughs> River in New York City. But uh, but we but yes, our original office was a double-wide trailer with a uh, extension cord for power in the back of a parking lot in, in Greenpoint, New York. Uh, we didn't have any bathrooms, but we did have panoramic views of downtown Manhattan. So, you know, you win some, you lose some of that, right? Uh, but since then, we've had, you know, 13 offices and uh, currently occupying four offices globally. And uh, we've gone through this a, a, a tremendous period of growth. What was what was what was what was that initial year like? Because you used to be over at Echo, if I'm not mistaken. What made you decide to to go out on your own and get in that trailer? Well, I was 26 at the time, and I uh, didn't know nearly as much as I thought I did. Uh, but the original plan was that we just wanted to go make you know all the money for ourselves, right? Yeah, we didn't want to we didn't want to have to keep splitting uh, splitting the commissions with with the house. You know what I mean? Uh, but Quickly, I caught on and we started uh, doing business with bigger and bigger and more and more established customers and carriers. And, you know, we started in uh, fall of 2014, we did a million dollars in sales in our first quarter, and then we did $10 million in sales in our first full year in 15. So, uh, so it, it got going pretty quick and uh, quickly, it was no longer just a, a small lifestyle business and started hiring people and uh, really focused on growth. Interesting. You know, so I, I always thought of you as a Chicago company until I was reading more into your background. I didn't realize the whole um, past life in New York. How did you, I mean, I know Chicago is like the epicenter of freight. Um, some people might argue Chattanooga, but I'd probably lean towards Chicago. I saw the debate in Chicago <laughs> and who won. Why the move to Chicago? So uh, our next topic, non-competes, had a little something to do with that, but we uh, we were restricted geographically, um, so we had to leave town for a little few years. But uh, but then uh, once that was over, we 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 quickly came back. Originally, we started back in Rosemont in uh, 2017, and then uh, moved downtown about two years later. So you, I, I'm I want to know about this one million in sales because that's really that's really good. Did you already you had a pre-existing book of business you were bringing in, or how did how did you how did you stand that up so quick? Uh, well, it was an odd time, if anybody remembers, way back to 2014, but it was the, uh, the polar vortex and a lot of different weather-related uh, capacity issues really helped us accelerate. Uh, so good timing there. And then, yeah, we had some previous relationships with uh, some clients that I had done business with and some of the other co-founders had done business with. But honestly, dinner was mostly just cold calling, trying to spread enthusiasm, trying to make big promises, and then, and then execute on them. You know, just listen to what our customers want and uh, build a broker drug map, you know. You started young, 26 years old. You had this really successful year. How did you learn how to scale? Like, I remember when I started in sales, I had to learn how to sell, and that was its own process. I, let alone thinking about scaling an entire company to multiple offices. How did you, how did that come about? How did, what was that learning process like? Well, it, it was definitely trial by fire, but uh, I think our, our growth plan has always been pretty much the same since day one. Uh, we're really focused on three main things. We're focused on our product, we're focused on our people, and we're focused on our purpose. 
And by product, what I mean is both you know, our digital freight matching product capacity, which is you know available in the app store and online, uh, both for carriers and shippers, and creating that environment where great companies can come and conduct business with each other and have a seamless uh, and frictionless user experience. Uh, but also just winning in the trenches. You know, we've always been really focused on our performance and our carrier scorecard and, you know, separating ourselves by, by actual real-time impact performance. Uh, not just tender acceptance, on-time delivery, and like the basic KPIs, but, you know, real impact and being able to solve actual problems for our customers. And by, you know, by that, be really rewarded with growth. You know, and then on the carrier side, you know, we're very big on our, our product being, we're, we're carrier advocates. We try to, you know, be an extension of our carrier sales team. We try to position our carriers in a place where they can really win in our customer network. Um, and by focusing on those parts of our product, we've been able to be, you know, pretty good in terms of, you know, it's not always one step forward, no steps back or anything like that. But overall, our aggregate has always been bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And then with people, you know, we always tell everybody in, in the business that, you know, in order to get either a customer or a carrier, you know, to really want to do business with you, to really actively participate in your network, which is the magic of what it's really all about. They have to know, like, and trust you before you ask for an order uh, or before you ask them to take a load or before, you know, whatever whatever the case may be in that, in that situation. And we really want to build a team of people that are known, liked, and trusted by all the different stakeholders in, in our organization by really focusing on personnel development and giving people a chance to really succeed and build businesses within our business. Um, we've, been, we've been able to really deliver on that um, you know, over the last nine years, and, you know, especially since we've been really focused on expanding the management team and all that kind of stuff. Sure, that's a lot. Um, of and energy. then the last thing, yeah. go ahead. So the last thing is our purpose, you know, the why. The why do we do this and, and, and what's the purpose of the company long term? And for us, it's always been just to shatter the status quo expectations of what it's like to do business with a broker in this business, both for shippers and for carriers, and being able to uh, you know, march the industry forward to a place where you know, we can go faster, we can do more business per person, and we can do it more accurately. Um, and I think by focusing on all those things, you know, we've been able to really drive growth over the last night. So, and let's talk about that growth. What is the biggest difference between walking into a $160 million brokerage versus walking into a 10 million brokerage? Uh, it's definitely harder to grow 100% every year. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> but uh, but it, it really is the same. You know, we, uh, we have more people, we have more customers, and we uh, work with more carriers. But, you know, the, the, the process on every life, on the life of the load every time is really is really similar and uh and we just focus on doing good business and uh you know fueling our growth uh with our margins you know we've never raised any outside capital or anything like that it's been 100 percent organic and uh you know that i think that's been the biggest you know big difference between us and a lot of the other emerging businesses in the landscape is that we've uh we've done things the the, the old way you know by reinvesting your margins and, and growth and by betting on yourself over and over and over again. Interesting. The old way, but some new ways. We're going to get into tech in a minute, but you mentioned non-competes, and that came up in the State of the yeah. Union. There's starting to be congressional pressure, but uh, uh, even on LinkedIn just the other day, you're like, inner Steve Cox came out, and you're like, you know what? I'm sick of these non-competes. I'm sick of people setting up to me. A lot of people are getting fired. I'm going to start posting these things. And you also mentioned, like, it affected your business in the very beginning. It sent you to Chicago. What is your opinion on non-competes? Uh, I think not competes serve a purpose in, in the United States, uh, but the purpose that they've served for a long time in the freight brokerage industry is misguided. Uh, I think there's really two applications. You have non competes for executive managers who may who have a ton of comp and a ton of teeth in the game um, and have a lot of really you know top level inside information that you know management teams and boards trust them with in order to run companies. And those folks you know should be able to be subjected to non-competes if they agree to it and if they're co compensated for it. Uh, but mo more, more what we talk about when we complain about, you know, bad actors and non-competes in, in our businesses, you know, targeting, you know, naive and young new entries um, coming right out of college and hiding non-compete clauses 
and agree not compete agreements in, in original employing employment onboarding documents. Uh, you know, everybody everybody signs up for apps and you read the terms and conditions and you just kind of click through that stuff. I think a lot of a lot of times naive employees are si- are signing away their futures in ways that they can't possibly understand at the time that they're being that they're discussing the jobs with the potential employer. And and for me, I think uh, you know, big large organizations kind of spending a lot of money and employing you know legal teams to enforce these uh, you know really you know meritless claims against you know employees who are just trying to you know move forward in their careers is is wrong and it, and it shouldn't be tolerated by you know the courts, the law firms, the insurance companies, or all these other folks that you know make a lot of money dealing with it. Especially when people are fired, right? I mean, like that should just destroy the covenant right there. That's I mean, it's like ridiculous. It's like someone's making sixty thousand dollars or less a year, right, in some of these brokerage jobs out of school, and they they haven't sold anything. They're no threat to you. Make them go poison the well someplace else. But you want to tell them they? Can, I remember mine was like, you can't sell anything within a hundred miles of any of their offices for three years. Yet here's a problem: they, they cover like most of America. Like you can't even work. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, the uh, the the structure of the agreements are odd and they vary greatly. Um, but in my experience, they are extremely difficult to enforce in, in reality. Um, real damages, monetary damages, need to be proven, uh, and, and there needs to be a direct uh, responsibility of both the new employer and the and the employee as a bad actor in order for that to be really held up. So, you know, if you really unpack the, the cases, the only big ones that have ever really been ruled in the favor of the employer have been ones where real information was stolen or was, uh, you know, shared with somebody outside our organization in a very illegal and, and, and you know, malicious way. Uh, just people, you know, I think one of the big goalposts that we need to really define the big line of this is what is intellectual property and what is proprietary information. Because for me, you know, going into a grocery store and seeing that, you know, catalog ships a lot of freight doesn't mean that, you know, that's a secret, you know. <laughs> um, so, so it's kind of like what, what, uh, what, what's what, you know. And uh, I think you never really hear a lot about, you know, these c- cases getting to court and ruling in, in the favor of the employer. It's more of a strong arm tactic that uh, that that scares people and restricts uh, employee movement and uh, and forces people to pay. For lawyers and uh, deal with court cases and you know uh, discovery and other stuff that they're incapable of really doing realistically. That's it. Um, so you know, and, and it, scares, it scares people away from hiring good people. Um, so that's the kind of way I look at it. Does that make sense? It, it, no, it sure it, it sure does. Now, the other thing I wanted to hit on here is you mentioned that you built Edge doing things the the old way with fundamentals. However, you won digital freight matching platform of the year, doing things kind of the new way. Yes. Talk about Gosh, merging that old with, with tech. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we started building our own technology about five years ago. Uh, all our developers are on South America and it's been something that's been really fun for me, for me personally. Um, and I think it's been a really big differentiator for the organization. Originally our, our platform was carrier facing only. Most of our clients are large enterprise organizations, and they don't really participate actively in our technology. It's more of a our solution is more of a bolt-on solution to their pre-existing TMS or whatever enterprise systems they're running. And we kind of act as a carrier within their network in most cases. So we were always really focused on building for the carriers, um, and we know what it's like to do business with a broker. I uh, and because I used to work at some of the big brokers, and so have a lot of the rest of our our team. And the the Practice of going on DAT, calling an 800 number, waiting on hold, discussing a load, going back and forth, pausing, waiting, putting, maybe waiting for manager approval, only to find that they sold the load to somebody else or whatever, and then starting that process over again with the next broker is, is just not a quality way of doing business. I mean, we really thought that you know those status quo expectations could be really shifted over a long period of time and a lot of consistent good business. Um, and so that's what we built. Uh, it was capacity. And since then, it's been a, a, a real flagship product for us. We have 16,000 active carriers using it all the time. Um, we got like five or six 
uh, interactions on every load offer we have. Uh, you know, so way more carriers are participating than we actually have loads for. Um, and that's been one of the things that's really been able to drive our growth uh, and allow us to, as we get big awards and as we take big steps forward with some of our big customers uh, and some of our new customers, we're able to really match that demand by, you know, getting in front of, getting our best loads in front of our best carriers first and giving them time to interact with the freight and uh, having that net result be one where we have really high first tender capacity realization rates, really high carrier retention rates, um, a lot of re same carriers doing the same loads over and over again, and a lot of those efficiencies that really allow us to you know, punch above our weight class. Wow. Hey, before I let you go, and, and really cool, everyone go check that out. Before I go, though, what's your favorite story so far from building this company? What really sticks out in your mind? Is there, is there a certain day or an incident? What was, what, what, what's there in your mind? Uh, I think the award that we're, the, we're most proud of is when we won the Niagara Bottling Carrier of the Year Award for Inbound Logistics in 2020. Uh, Niagara's been our, our biggest customer for a long time, and, to, uh, and it's one of the most competitive broker and carrier networks uh, in the United States. And for us to you know, build a service offering around them and scale it for years and, uh, and then be recognized in the community for excellence um, in, in performance was probably our most proud moment so far. But we've had a lot of really great ones. Uh, that we've been on the Inc. 5000 list for five years in a row, Cranes Fast 50 in Chicago for you know three. And uh, you know, there's been a lot of really, really great times. And I think the relationships we have with some of the longtime uh, partners here, a lot of some of the longtime employees have been you know, the things that I cherish the most. Sure, I and mean, that's an edge story, but how about you personally? Is it, do, you got, do you got a story? What do you mean? Uh, Sorry, you put me on the spot, but... Oh, it's all good. I know, it's, it could be hard to come up with one. No, I hear you. I don't have a Yeah. No, it's all good. So, hey, people want to reach out to you. I have a big announcement I'd like to share if you have time. Is that cool? Yeah, do that. Let's hear it. Yeah. All right, great. So uh, soon, I will no longer be the president of Edge Logistics. I'm going to become the, C the first CEO in our history, and we hired an industry legend to, uh, to replace me and to help us get to the next level here at Edge. Um, we are announcing that we've hired Blaine Barnett to be the next uh, president of Edge Logistics. He's had a number of spots in, uh, in different really admirable brokerages um, over the last 10, 15 years, and we can't wait till he starts next week. Um, and I just want to take the time to announce that here today. Well, hey, a little cowbell for, for you. Congratulations, yeah. Mr. CEO, Captain C-Suite over here. Congratulations yeah. to your new president. I'm sure you're going to be great. And look, you yeah. guys doubled revenue over like the past two years. Maybe you'll quadruple it over the next yeah. two. I'm rooting for you, Will. Thanks, Theodore. Thanks for having me. Take care and congratulations. Excellent stuff. Wow. Nice announcement, too. Anytime you get a really great announcement, come at your boy. But it can't be like, you know, some like product feature or something. It's got to be something cool, right? It's got to involve people. Anyways, let's go here. China, India, Vietnam, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Mexico. AIT Worldwide Logistics has 2,000 supply chain experts in these countries. And of course, in offices across the United States. And in 2023, they're adding more locations around the world as organizations continue to expand and make it easier than ever for customers to ship between Asia, Europe, and North America. Um, if you're ready to create a shipping program as unique as your business, as unique as this show, as unique as Justin's beard, you can learn more at AITWorldwide.com. Go check it out. All right, now it's time for a fight for survival. It is our own little version of Squid Game here on What the Truck Called What the Trivia. And whoever loses this, a trap door is going to open under the floor in, the, in their own house, and they're just going to fall in their basement. And then it's just up to them to survive. No, I'm just kidding. It's what the trivia, and we got the rooster. <laughs> and super trucker. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they never give you a sound. I just want to hear you make a horn sound every time I'm on. I try to be consistent. I think I'm sticking with the same. Did you identify what kind of horn that was? That was a, that was an air horn on a truck. Was, yeah, yeah. That's not your trivia. I'm just kind of warming you you guys up. Okay. Before we jump into things, so we don't run out of time. A um, couple announcements. You guys just put out a new podcast today. Let people know what that's about, uh, Justin. Uh, so 
Sorry, we're getting them all mixed up here. We we just recorded with a with a guy. Uh, <laughs> when we recorded, the one we recorded yesterday was with um uh, a, a couple we I found on TikTok called the Bombs. Uh, they they go by Married to the Road. Uh, they're absolutely crushing it on TikTok. They're an older couple. Uh, a for, a former, I'm sorry, a fellow A A and E uh hauling couple like I was uh when I was over the road. Uh, it was so much fun talking with them. I got to reminisce about all the old uh, government freight that uh, I used to haul. Uh, we we covered their careers. Um, growing their brand, and uh, they have a couple of really good charities. Uh, Treated Trucker, uh, they've done a really good job with charity work. Uh, you know, getting drivers meals uh, out of their own pocket. Uh, so def- that'll be dropping. Uh, that's dropped today. Absolutely, yeah, uh, to, uh, take a listen. Yeah, it came out at uh, eleven o'clock. Rooster, what's one thing you learned from that episode? What's one one reason people should listen? Uh, one of the reasons to uh, be great to list there. Uh, Merited Road is a great a resource there uh, have a lot of knowledge between them they're actually a land star contracted carrier like i was and they uh, they could instill a lot of knowledge to the young people of wanting to become owner operators and also their driver advocates with a new organization no organization ra North, the north american driver resources association uh, okay. they're one of the leading groups that's going around uh, trying to get some of the harder, harder driver regulations smoothed out. Uh, cool. Possibly we reworking some hours of service issues, the and cap nice. recording devices and items and such. Okay, I said one thing. You listed like twenty. I just wanted one little nugget. <laughs> I wanted one thing. I'm going to learn rooster, but there it sounds like there will be plenty within that podcast. So go to back look at back the truck up wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe to that, and while you're there. Subscribe to What the Truck if you're not, or subscribe to Freightcast. And you'll get every single Freightways podcast all on one feed, including Back the Truck Up and including What the Truck. But boys, it is time to test your wits and your smarts and uh, your right. ability to understand my own psychology. So here we go. Question number one. It's a video question. Video daily double. And now, guys, we don't have buzzers yet, so I need you to raise your hand right before before I can call on you. Okay? Don't just yell at the answer. Here it is. Play the first clip. I bet none of you truck drivers have this right here. Let me show you. I'm going to open up my handy-dandy side box. It's and then I'm going to grab this right here. Let me show you all what this is. Okay. Whoever can identify that, it's Justin. It's a tandem lock. Ah, it's a tandem lock. You're already up on the board. 1-1. One, one. You caught Rooster flat-footed. And you ran right past him in your Nike sneakers. Actually, here's a little clip about what these things do, in case you're not familiar. So this right here, this is a tandem stopper. Let me show you how you use this. So I don't have a heavy load that I got to slide my tandems on, getting loaded or anything like that, nor am I at a cat scale. Here we go. So the first thing you'll do when you go to slide your tandems, of course, you're going to pull your handle out. Uh, get it locked in the groove and then pretty good handle in there depending too. on which way you want to slide let's say we need to slide People two making holes fun of that right on TikTok we saying, got oh, one two so we're truck. gonna put it right here then we're gonna slide back until it locks right here now if we were sliding forward we'd do the same thing but for the back of the tray i've had one of these things for quite a while now i love them they save me a lot of time whenever i'm scaling my loads uh, or just need to slide my tandems to a certain position, I ain't going to sit there and fight with it most of the time getting in and out of the truck. So these are pretty helpful. They'll help you scale your load, especially if you know what you're doing. You'll be able to scale your load and slide your tandems once or maybe twice at the most if you get it wrong. Good stuff. You, you, do, uh, you use one of those tandem locks? They sound pretty handy. No, I actually have never had to slide a tandem in probably 10 years, but Ooh. back when I was, that thing would have been super handy because there's nothing worse than pulling it too far forward or too far back and then having to do it over and over and over again. Interesting. How about you, Rooster? Uh, not exactly that design of a Tim stopper. Mine was more of like the flagpole that sticks out past the tire, but it, it the slide and tandems is a work of art, understanding how much weight each position on the slide moves. So it's kind of one of those things drivers need to learn. Very cool. All right, next question. One nothing, Super Trucker. At what moment did he realize he messed up? Roll the tape. Right there. Ouch. Yep, right there. All right, no one's raised their hand. 
but the answer has been given away. All right, I'm gonna give it to oh, I'm sorry. gonna give it to Justin. <laughs> I'm gonna give it to Super Trucker. Yes, it was. I think it was not until he got hit in the face with uh, with that forklift right there. With the, uh, the actually, I'll, I'll I'll correct you on that too. That's a long boy, not a forklift. Okay, so what is the difference between a long boy and a forklift? Well, forklift is able to lift the pallet up off the ground. Yes. And a long a long boy picks up multiple pallets at once, but only maybe a couple inches off the ground. Okay, well, we're getting a, uh, a whole dug here, Rooster, but there's a good chance. This category right now is one you are fond and familiar with. It's video games. Name the four consoles that appear from the sides of the Switch in this video. Roll the tape. Now, the sides of that Switch, very cool, by the way. An artist did this, this thing, although the automation seems like it would break pretty easily. He's going to zoom in. There's four consoles inside there. I'm, cu I'm curious about the ones on the wings. You've only seen two so far, Justin. Okay, you guys can raise your hand anytime. All right, is Justin's hand is up. Uh, the NES, SNES, GameCube, and S64. Okay, you were so close. You were so close, yet so far away. Oh, no. You had three oh, of those yeah. right, but one of those wrong, and you may want to take I a just close have... look. Rooster, can you, do you know what system he named wrong? Uh, no, I do not. So that is not super a Famicom. Super Nintendo. It's a Super Famicom. It's the Japanese version. Do we got like a... There we go. Bang them both. <laughs> Drop them both through the floor. Uh, that was close though. Did you have all those systems? Did you have an N64? Were you a, a GameCube guy? Yeah, yeah. I was a uh, kid. My dad was a Sega guy. All right. I had everything up to GameCube. Past that, I, I don't even have a Switch. So anything past GameCube, I didn't get into... None of the Wii's, none of the stuff like that. All right. Well, the new Breath of the Wild game's coming out, so you may want to get one. Here we go. Here is a, another video question. Roll the tape. We get a lot of uh, questions uh, about 11 foot eight bridges. People ask all the time, why don't you put something in the way to let people know that the bridge is 11 foot eight? So if you're going to hit it, then uh, you hit it first and not the bridge. Well, let me show you. So there's our bar. We have chains on it. Basically, you hit that, you're gonna hit the bridge. And uh, it does a really good job. Oh wait, no it doesn't. Stop <laughs> hitting bridges. Okay, here's the question. And again, raise your hand, whoever has it up first wins. Why do truck drivers keep hitting bridges? Google Maps. <laughs> okay, it's just, you gotta raise your hand, Rooster. It's Justin again. Yeah, I would say Google Maps. Google Maps. Why or don't those GPS. chains? Why don't those chains work? Like he said, the eleven foot eight thing. There's the sign. He's got the chains. It hits him on the top. Why, why does none of Could that be, resonate? Maybe they got headphones on. Maybe they're just not paying attention. Interesting. Have you guys hit? Have you hit a bridge before, Rooster? No, but that wonderful tunnel in Boston's kind of close to what I was driving at the time. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, Starro Drive is pretty, pretty terrible out there. Also, okay. So what was that? What is that? Was that? Will that count? Google Maps? I guess I'll give uh, Google Maps. All right. Is that the only reason? Maybe it's good enough. How about this one right here? And this is interesting. This is almost like highlights. I don't know if you ever played that game. What I want you to do is when you're watching this video, point out as many wrong things as you can about what's going on with this self-driving Tesla through a parking lot. And whoever calls out the most wrong things is going to win the point. Roll the tape. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can you yell out those problems at any moment? Oh, well, keep, keep. should I raise my hand or? Yeah, whoever lists the most <laughs> problems like... wins. I want you to narrate this uh, with the problems you see. Well, it's going the wrong way. It's going too fast. It's crossing the uh, painted lines. It didn't yield. Uh, <laughs> probably not using its turn, its, uh, turn signals whatsoever. Do you, do you use turn and... signals in like a grocery store parking lot though? At an intersection like this, yes. Right yeah. where it needs to go either left or right. Um, wow, yeah, it's going over a speed bump. Does it, I mean, it's kind of uh, driving its own way. It's going through spaces and it doesn't seem to know which side of the road it's supposed to be on. No, it's very confusing. What's, what's also kind of scary is like, you don't know what it's thinking to do until it does it. Rooster sees no problem with this so far. He just wants a self-driving car. I've not really, but you know, if you guys got a good internet provider, I would really love one right about now. 
<laughs> he's, he's playing on a handicap. I've, I've got, uh, I'm, I'm watching everything in real time. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, we're going to have to give him a, a slight delay, though. Um, here's another video one. I'll wait until it plays before I even ask you the question and before you even raise your hands to call. We'll give him a fair shot at this one because he's starting to fall behind. It's 4 nothing, and we only have 10 questions on this. Right? So we got, I might have to like add more points to the next ones. What did this driver do wrong? This is our back the truck up question of the week. Hmm. And it's not pull a swift trailer. Here he comes. Doof. Oof. Okay, Ow. Rooster has his hands up. Rooster is, is back in the game and he's ready to fight. What's up, Rooster? He failed to follow the golden rule. Get out and look. Yeah, what what do you do in a situation like that? It almost looked like two vehicles were moving too. Um, uh, you have one truck coming in, and you had the Swift backing up, but I don't even know if the Swift was even had any situational awareness around him that the other truck's coming. Uh, the None the whatsoever. lineup was already poor because he was angled at the wrong angle, so it, it was just a whole basket of errors. Interesting. In the audio in that video, the the guy that gets hit, he's laying on his horn trying to warn the Swift truck backing into him. Yeah, yeah. I, th I thought we had audio on there, but they made have put like a, a there might have been a soundtrack underneath that we had to mute. I'm not really sure. But yeah, someone's definitely beeping at the guy. That context was lost a little bit in that video. Okay, but it's you know Rooster is coming back, so he's got he's got another chance here. He's got another. Oh, looks like the production team is cheering for you. By the way, shout out to AI Isaiah. He is uh, running the director's chair in the back seat today. His first time, so give him a round of applause. Um, let's see here. What do we got next? Oh, this is the Rachel Premack question of the week. Cardboard box prices rose by as much as X percent during the pandemic. I got my hand up. Okay, we got Justin here. Oh, uh, um, 200%. Mm. Beep him. No, too high. Be beep him, beep him to hell. You got that buzzer? <laughs> I'll buzzer him. Rooster, you got a guess? Mm. You got a guess? It's, it's going to be lower. I'll give you a hint. I gave you guys the uh, article. I gave you guys the article. I interviewed her during this very show. <laughs> hey, we're tied up. Uh, being able to hold a hell of a lot of cardboard in my time, I want to say probably about 55%. You, you did read it. He read it. He Look at that. He's playing coy. He got the exact number. It was 55%. <laughs> and look at Justin. He got off to a strong start. But Rooster, Rooster, he doesn't come off the line fast. But when you hear that rumble coming behind you, you know that freight train's oh, on the well, way. Oh, and I was, yeah, I mean, I'm fourth generation logger anyway, so I kind of know a little bit. You're a fourth generation logger? Yeah. Interesting. You, you're a farmer and a logger and a, like, is there any, any, any blue collar thing you can't do, Rooster? Uh, well, I, I got coal miners in the family, but I hadn't went and actually mined coal myself. But, you know, if it's blue collar, <laughs> I've done it. I can, I can see Justin with a pickaxe coming out of a coal mine. Like, that would track. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he comes from a, a long line of uh, <laughs> of, of miners. <laughs> they found the original Lord of the Ring. Um, <laughs> all right, next question. <laughs> next, next question. In 1996, right? What what was the first toll free area code put in service after the supply of 800 numbers dwindled? It is Justin Super Trucker. 888. It is 888. Not not 976 like you were thinking, Rooster. Keep your mind out of the gutter. No, he's yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, they got 888, 866. There's, there's a couple of them still around. That used to be a big problem. Remember those numbers? They would, like, prey on kids when you got home from school, and it'd be like, call Woody Woodpecker up, and it would be, like, 299. A oh, no, they'd be, like, yeah. 99 cents for the first minute, and the fine print would be, like, 299 a minute. I remember I called one of those as a kid, and I was on the phone for, like, seven minutes, and my parents... Tan my high. They freaked out so bad. I don't remember. I, the cost could have been like that much, but I think they were afraid. Th that was like our generation's version of like in-app purchases where you give your kid the phone and next yeah. thing you know, they bought like $20,000 worth of uh, skins in Fortnite. The, the Nintendo tip hotlines, you know, the, it was like, I think it was a 1-900 number too. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't cheap calling in that one. 
Oh no, or the WCW hotline. You ever call into Scheme Gene? No. Rooster? No. <laughs> I know you did. You uh, called up Mean Gene. No. no, I have not. Luckily, I've not. Uh, now, I've bought a lot of magazines. but You, you didn't want to know I the rumors at the Four the Horsemen? Whole, uh, for breaking up? Hotline. All right, well, no. this, is, this is a wrestling question. <laughs> this is no, a wrestling related question. We're going back to the 90s. Who did Stone Cold Steve Austin win his first WWE championship from? It is Justin. I'm going to take a wild guess here. The Rock. And uh, no. Rooster. Mm. Rooster. Uh, if we're going, t- if we're going titles, uh, world championship. Be a- world, not intercontinental. Oh, world title. Not Owen uh, Hart breaking his neck at SummerSlam. Was it Diesel? Oh, oh. Mm. beep him with the Diesel? loudest beep. We need to play the heart. Yes, kid, I deserve Shawn it. Michaels music right in this uh. room where he sings his own theme song. Did you like it better when he sung his theme song or when Sensational Sherry sang his theme song? Uh, Sherry version, you know, and I, I should kick myself for not knowing the Battle of Texas. How didn't you? Mike Tyson that, was that in was that. was a great build up. Mike Tyson was in that match. They, that, they, um, that hmm. WrestleMania was in Boston, that government center, a couple days before it happened. They set up a big ring in um, in the plaza there, and mass holes were like throwing batteries at, at Triple H and Shawn Michaels. They were just flipping out, like chucking everything they could at the ring. I swear, I don't know. I don't think people in mass, like, I don't think we thought wrestling was real, but uh, I think that we just like an excuse. Well, to, it, it, uh, it's, it's Connecticut people. versus Massachusetts, so I guess, you know, that's the rivalry there. That's true. But Shawn Michaels is from Texas, so yeah. Steve Austin was originally built from Hollywood, California when he came out in uh, WCW. But he's not. All right, let's talk about rates a little bit, right? There's no coming back for you, Rooster, but you can still leave with your head held high by making Justin walk out with another boo-boo. Number 10. What is Freightwave's National Truckload Index seven-day average for today? I'm not a sonar expert whatsoever. Have, um, this is a chart I've literally slacked to them um, less than an hour before the show. <laughs> Full disclosure. Yeah, right during our podcast recording, so really couldn't look <laughs> at it, but I won't say 234. You're wrong. 249. Because you're looking at Slack where I just said it to you. Although you still get points for being, yeah, hey, look, you still get points for being smart. I didn't say you couldn't cheat, and that was the smartest move that you could have done was look it up right then. <laughs> wow so th- this is this has been tough on the back the truck up team because we've done what the trivia twice and it's 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 been bittersweet right because bj our editor was embarrassed last week by mario mario just proved her in, in her intellect and why she has multiple podcasts and, and newsletters and she just put bj in the corner and then today justin came on and he put rooster in the corner but the only problem is you guys are both on the same team do you think this will cause we'll a have conflict? To have a... No, no. We'll have to have a, a contest between me and Mary next. Oh, yeah. Well, we, no, we've got a bunch of other names booked, so we'll have a tournament of champions at the end, which Excellent. you have qualified for. Sadly, Rooster, you have not qualified for I the live tournament in the of corner, champions. So whatever. You do get a toaster <laughs> as a parting gift. Justin, yeah. what are you going to do to celebrate? Make a TikTok about it? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's only the first step in the road to victory. So, you know, I'll, we'll see what happens once I reach that uh, the top of the mountain there. By the way, is it just the hue of, are, are, are you are you okay? Are your cheeks kind of red right now? Is it the stress of being on trivia? Uh, I had uh, a nice little cup of coffee and it's a little warm in here. So <laughs> my cheeks my cheeks are a little flush from all the <laughs> caffeine. You got a little Irish blood in you? You just, you just turn like bright red during this interview. <laughs> you kind of look like, you don't remember like Veruca saw she ate the blueberry in Willy Wonka and she just turned, she yeah, turned yeah, bright yeah, blue? Yeah. That, but like yeah. a cherry. No, I have my fan off and it's, it's getting a little toasty in here for sure. Very cool. Well, Rooster, people head over to backthetruckup.com. What, what headlines are up there from uh, today and yesterday? I know there's one about Nimby's in this border town in Arizona, which we got really confused by a menu until we realized it was in pesos. <laughs> yeah, uh, San Luis, Arizona has now put its name on the the trucker NIMBY list. Uh, they really st- basically put out a Facebook post yesterday saying, uh, if you're 
truck driver, do not park your truck in a residential area. You're going to be ticketed. So that's got everybody trying to figure out, well, where can we park now? There's not a not a truck parking for, you know, 60 miles. So you know, how are we going to survive, you know? And it can't fix the, I don't know, I mean, can't keep the border secure. Got to get the trucks out, right? I mean, they, they, they kick, yeah. <laughs> it's just wild world. The NIMBYism everywhere. It doesn't, I, apparently it doesn't matter where your, uh, where your zip code is. Is everybody go over to backtruckup.com, look up what the truck, wherever you get podcasts, look up back the truck up, wherever you get podcasts, subscribe to both shows or get Freightcast, get them all in one feed, download the Freight Wave so you have to watch all this in beautiful, stunning HD. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. Don't be a stranger and take care.